All right, welcome back. So we are now finally going to dive into the deuterostomia. Whee! So most of the semester we've been covering the protostomes, so now let's do the deuterostomes. So we need to first go through an introduction to these guys and a review of those characteristics, which you guys should already have committed to memory. Um, we'll talk about the defining characteristics, included taxa, and then we'll dive into two major groups, the echinodermata, which are very unique and bizarre, and then after that, we're going to talk about the hemichordates, which the group itself is relatively small, and we're going to only go over it briefly. But in order to put them into context, you need to understand the major features of the chordate. So we'll have to review that stuff. So let's dive in. So in the deuterostomia, you have things like um, the echinodermata, so things like starfish and sea urchins. And then later on, we're going to cover these guys. So these are the tunicates, or the urochordates, really bizarre-looking creatures. Hard to believe they're closely related to us. These are the hemichordates. We're actually going to cover these today, not these guys. Uh, and then later, we're going to talk about lancelets, or amphioxus, which are uh, close relatives to the chordates, believe it or not. And then eventually, we're going to get into the chordates. And so here's an example of one type of chordate. So here's that tree I've been showing you again and again and again. And by the way, just to clear up some confusion that I heard about yesterday, so when I talked about the final exam being um, cumulative or comprehensive, I only mean concerning this tree. The only thing that's going to be comprehensive is free drawing this tree um, and all of the major features on that. And I'm going to um, post a, another podcast independently to sort of walk you guys through what I mean by that, what I'm expecting you to do. So hold that thought. So we're covering this group right here. So for all this time we've been talking about the protostomes, now we're finally going to talk about the deuterostomes. So this includes the echinodermata, the hemichordata, and the chordata, and we're going to blow out the chordata later on and look at it in some depth. So these guys are all coelomate, okay? All of them are true coelomates. So what are the key features of the deuterostomes? So you remember this table from the very beginning of the semester. We've been talking about it again and again and again. But now, here you go. So whenever you see a deuterostome, be prepared to tell me what the fate of the blastopore is and what kind of cleavage it has. It's radial. How does it form its body cavity by inter interocele? And it's a regulative embryo. So when you um, pull off one of the cells, um, even at the actually from the 2 to the 8 cell stage, it will develop normally. You'll get two normal looking larval forms. By the way, I should probably clarify these terms, and I thought maybe this was obvious, but I realized yesterday that it's not obvious. Protostome versus deuterostome. So deut um, comes from uh, two, uh, the Latin and Greek forms of two. The reason it's called the deuter, and stome means mouth or hole, the reason it's called the deuterostomes is because even though the blastopore, which is here, this is what forms at the beginning of gastrulation, even though that's sort of the first hole in, in deuterostomes, it forms the anus first, what really happens is you actually have two holes forming at the same time. So one is gonna be, going to become the anus, that's the original blastopore. This is a different hole. It's going to become your mouth, ultimately. But this has a different name, and we're not going into the gory details of um, developmental biology. But it's called deuterostome because really you have two holes forming at the same time, whereas in the protostomes it's just one. Okay, and it's the beginning, the proto, the first stone. You know. Okay, so be able to com uh, commit all of these characteristics to memory, and then when it comes to... Uh, that cumulative question on the final, you'll need to know all of these features. Okay, so here's the deuterostomia. Okay, the chordates we're going to get into later, and that's a really big portion, um, and we're going to talk about it in great detail. We're not going to cover these guys. We're only going to cover the echinodermata, and then one of the hemichordates. We're going to focus on the introduce as an example of the hemichordates at the end of this lecture today. Notice this term right here, though. Echinodermata, phylum echinodermata, and phylum hemichordata together form a group called the ambulacraria, and that's because they have several features in common. These right here, and we're going to talk about these in detail. Well, okay, brief detail. So what are the three main features of the ambulacraria? So what do these guys have in common with each other? Okay. 
Let me get rid of that for a moment. So when it comes, so this is a larval form um, of, a, of an echinoderm, uh, although it's very similar to the uh, larval forms of the hemichordates as well, as you'll see later. So when their coelom forms, their body cavities, they actually have what's called a trimeric or tripartite coelom. And that, that means there's three different cavities, three different compartments that you see initially in the larval form. And here's one, here's two, and here's three. Okay. So when they talk about having a tripartite uh, coelom, this is what they mean, that there are three uh, separated cavities that ultimately will come to be right up next to each other, but they actually will stay compartmentalized. By the way, just to orient you on this larval form, because you're going to see this um, several times, so here's the anus. Remember, it forms first. Here's the mouth. And you're going to go through an amazing transformation of uh, morphology to, to go from this larval form to adult echinoderms or hemichordates or whatnot. It's also showing you things like the pharyngeal gill slits, which is a major feature, um, a ciliated ring, but I'm not expecting you to know those parts, but know this general um, feature of this, uh, these guys. Pharyngeal gill slits is something that you're going to see a lot later. Okay, now this is a sea urchin, but it's just a representative of one of the um, ambulacraria. Okay, it's also a representative of the echinoderms. So the ambulacraria also all have an axial complex. Okay, and you see it right here. Um, the axial complex is basically their version of a kidney. So this is what's performing um, osmoregulation. It's um, or part of the osmoregulation anyway. Um, it's filtering out the waste from the circulatory system. Um, it's helping with ion balance, right? This is where their urine comes from, okay? So everything in the ambulacraria has an axial complex. So when we get to the hemichordates, don't forget, they have an axial complex too. Sometimes it's referred to just as the axial organ, by the way. So the main structure is referred to as an axial organ. But of course it has tubes going, you know, from the circulatory system and then out to um, uh, excrete the waste outside the body. The third major feature of the ambulacraria is that they have really unique larval morphologies. And I know that sounds really vague, but these pictures are meant to be indicating to you the diversity of larval morphologies that you see. So terms that you're going to hear very often are bipinaria larva. Um, you won't hear much about the, these other terms. These are very specific terms. But later on, we'll talk about the larval forms of hemichordates, specific names, and then once we get into the chordates. And what you'll find is that they look very bizarre. And we introduced metamorphosis uh, in the last chapter. You're going to see some really amazing metamorphosis in these guys, too. And I'll show you videos in class of um, my favorite uh, video on the developmental biology of actually sea biscuits. So, the three features of the ambulacraria, tripartite coelom, axial complex, and unique larval morphologies. You don't see these kind of morphologies anywhere else. Okay, so now let's go from the ambulacraria into the echinodermata. And these are the main features of the echinoderms, but let's go over them in a bit more detail. Okay. So one of the interesting and major features of the echinodermata is you've now begun to see an endoskeleton. So a skeletal structure, a support structure that's on the inside of your body rather than on the outside of your body like you saw with the arthropoda. Um, now the endoskeleton is not quite like ours though. It's not with bones that are all interconnected. Instead of, it's composed of these ossicles that you see here. And these are calcified structures that are sort of... Um, networked together to form a lattice work on the inside of the body that forms the support structure. So the support structure is really important, and we've talked about this a little bit in class. So with your muscles moving your body around, if they're jointed, if you have jointed appendages, and if the muscles can connect to that support structure, you're allowed a lot more force and fulcrum. So your physics of moving around is more complicated, but it allows you greater flexibility um, in your body to move and direct your movements. So these guys, this is the first time you'll have seen an endoskeleton, and of course you'll see it when we get to the chordates as well, but that's a completely separately evolved um, endoskeleton. So here you see it, and this is supposed to be the arm of a starfish. Um, 
uh, in cross sections that you can see. And so what you're seeing here, these little white things, this lattice work here, these are those ossicles forming that endoskeleton. And you see a little bit of it right here as well. So it allows it um, rigidity and structure, attachment for muscles, and, um, and they're interconnected, so it allows for quite a bit of flexibility. So rigidity and flexibility all at the same time. It also serves to protect the organs on the inside of the body as well. So echinoderms are really weird in the animal world because they've secondarily lost the sort of typical um, body arrangements that they were moving, that we were moving, well not moving towards, it's an incorrect way to refer to them, but um, they've lost that sort of anterior, posterior, that, that biradial or bi, um, bilateral symmetry is, is somewhat lost in these guys. They've actually become secondarily radially symmetric, which is kind of odd. Um, and they've lost that anterior, posterior um, anatomical orientation. They've gone back to an oral, aboral orientation. So they're free living, they're free swimming, um, but now they're radially symmetric. And in, in particular, they're pent radially symmetric. So there's five arms to them, right, or five sides to them. And, and they're uh, radiated around this central disc. And by the way, I just want to point out, I love pointing out the uh, inconsistencies and uh, anatomical uh, inaccuracies in uh, cartoon movies. So you'll see this later on in, in lecture, but um, this is a picture of Peaches um, from the um, uh, Finding Nemo movie. And, and actually, I don't remember if she showed up in Finding Dory. I don't think she did. But in any case, clearly you don't have two feet all along you know, the, the whole you know, bottom side, if you will, of the body of an echinoderm never minding that you don't have eyes right here and a mouth like that, although you do have actually a mouth on that side, but you don't have um, tube feet like this all the way throughout. Another really interesting major feature of all echinoderms is that they had what's called a water vascular system, and don't get confused, this is not a circulatory system, okay, it's not carrying blood in it. Um, they do have a circulatory system, but the water vascular system is what powers um, their movement and powers their tube feet. So this is um, the, the aboral side of the echinoderm. And if you flip it over on what, what you might call the bottom side is where you'll see the mouth. So that's the oral side. And there are grooves along um, each of the arms called ambulacral grooves. You see the term here. And within those grooves are the tube feet that they power. And, and they're kind of like suction feet. And we'll talk about some of the details of how the water vascular system works in, in lecture. But suffice it to say that each of these two feet is like a little sucker, sort of. Um, they, they do have amazing suction ability. And they move independently. And so within the body, they draw water in through this madreporite, and it goes through the water vascular system. And it's, it's a hydro um, pressure system that allows them to move these tube feet, and not only to locomote, but they can also attach to food items, things like mollusks, and they're, they're actually strong enough to open up a clamshell and eat it, or eat the innards anyway. So this water vascular system is a really important and major feature of echinoderms. So here's a, a close-up of this. So this is the oral side, the ab oral is underneath. So what happens is water comes in through this madrepore right here, it goes in to the, from the stone canal into this ring canal. Okay, the stone canal is what leads between the madreporite to the ring. And then water goes from the ring canal down these radial canals. And then it powers these, um, what you're seeing here are these little bulbs, or what are called ampulla. And so basically you can think of it as, if you think of like a turkey baster, or maybe like a, some kind of an eyedropper, right? So the turkey baster, the, the, the bulb, are, are these ampulla. Oops, my cord here are these ampulla, and then the bottom, the tube feet, is the bottom of the baster or the eyedropper. And, but it's a closed system, so it's not open like a baster or an eyedropper would be. So imagine that if you squeeze the eyedropper, right, if there's anything in there, right, it, 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 it pushes it out, okay? But imagine if it's a closed system, if you close the ampulla, it's now pressurized. And if you touch down onto a surface, let's say it was a turkey baster and it was open, then if you let go of the turkey baster, then you get suction up into your hand, okay? And when you squeeze back down on the ampulla, then it's going to release pressure and it's going to release from the surface. 
So that's basically the way the water vascular system powers the tube feet, too. As you squeeze um, the baster, it actually suctions down. and it, Or sorry, as you, it, it depends on the movement as you go along. Uh, it, usually as you squeeze down, it releases off. And as you let go, it suctions down. So it's all a pressurized system with this water um, going through the entire system. Uh, I don't care that you know Tedeman's body as a specialized structure. So another feature that most, but not all, echinoderms have are called pedicellariae. So these are structures on the surface of echinoderms, and they look like little bitty pinch pinchers. In fact, here's a picture of, there's different kinds of them. They're normally on the aboral surface, and they're used both for defense as well as to help clean themselves off. So most of these echinoderms are found on the surface of the ocean floor. And as a result, there's all kinds of particulate matter that will come descending down through the water column and land on top of them. So they use these pedicellariae to remove that particulate matter. But also, if anything's badgering them, they also pinch um, whatever's bothering them with these pedicellariae, with these little pinchers. And some of these actually have um, a sort of poison or venom inside them. And so they can actually be quite painful um, to, uh, when you're pinched with them. Now, not all echinoderms have these, and we'll point out which ones do and which ones don't. Another major feature of most echinoderms are what are called dermal branchiae, but sometimes in certain images there are diagrams referred to as papula. Okay? So these are little tubes. You can see the papula here coming out. There's actually several coming out through the skin from the inside of the body. And what these do is these um, facilitate respiration for them. So you can think of them almost like a tracheal system of echinoderms, although it's not quite exactly the same thing, but it's a passive. But it allows them to extract oxygen from the water. Okay, so those are the major features of the echinoderms, all of these features. Uh, this is a phylogeny from your book for the echinoderms, but we're not going to cover all of these. Um, we're just going to cover some examples. So we're going to focus on the asteroidia, which is the typical sort of sea stars or starfish. I don't care which term you use. I think people are being kind of overly um, PC when it comes to those terms. Um, but we're going to cover the echinoidia. So these are the things like um, sea urchins. And the holothuroidia are sea cucumbers. We're not going to talk about the ophiuroidia. These are the brittle stars. They're basically the same as the asteroids. The only difference being that, that they have these really stringy looking um, arms with a a really distinct central disc, whereas these guys have fat arms that are not as distinctly set off from the central disc. So let's go into each of these um, categories. Sorry, each of these um, classes. Um, so the asteroidia, located here. Oh, by the way, I should probably note, um, the e you should know that the um, e echinoidia and holothuroidia are sister taxa relative to the asteroidia, even though we are skipping some of these other taxa. So this is a sort of a classic looking um, uh, sea star or starfish, um, a classic member of the asteroidia. So they look like an asteroid, not really, but you know, star shaped is what that really means. So they're not stalked, and this would make, uh, this would have more meaning for you if we covered the crinoids, because the crinoids often have a stalk, and so it makes them look very plant-like or flower-like. Uh, but these guys are not stalked. They are clearly pent radial. Um, the arms are broadly connected to the central disc, so they're not set off from the central disc like you see in these guys. The oral surface is down, face down, okay, and so it's usually contacting the surface. The madreporite is on the ab oral surface, so it's somewhere up here, and I'm going to guess this is the madreporite here. Sometimes when you're looking specifically at sea stars, it's hard to see exactly where it is, but usually you can find it. It's kind of hard and stony feeling, whereas the rest of the starfish is kind of um, squishy. The suckers are on the podia, or the feet or arms. So if you turn it upside down, you'll see the um, two feet there. And they do have pedicellariae. Um, and I'll show you video, videos in class of the clam, uh, uh, basically, of sea stars feeding. Okay, let's go into the second class. So this is the echinoidea. So these are things like um, sand dollar, sea biscuits, and sea urchins. So one of the key features is if you look on the undersides of them, so on the oral side, 
they had this structure called an Aristotle's lantern. And these are basically the jaws um, of, the, of, of these members of the Echinoidea. So they can actually use these to, they're often uh, 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 herbivores, and so they're often eating on sea kelp and vegetative material, and they use this Aristotle's lantern to actually um, chew off bits of it, and they're very sharp, um, the, the parts of the Aristotle's lantern, and they're constantly sharpening them. They're constantly growing and sharpening. Um, so this is on the underside, and you can actually see it here on the underside of this uh, sea urchin. So normally sea urchins have a very long digestive tract. So if the mouth is here, basically all of this uh, structure right here, this long tube, this is their intestine. And they have a very long intestine because as vegetarians, usually vegetative material because it's very fibrous, um, because it's made of uh, plant cells that are often very rigid, they're hard to break down. And so you often find that uh, herbivores have very long intestines with a, a, a lot of absorptive um, surface area to help them, uh, and they usually have associated bacteria in their guts to help them break down that vegetative material and absorb it. And it takes a long time to be able to digest that material. Um... By the way, we're going to talk about some of the other features of the echinoidea, but one thing that I'll mention here is, notice that they're, they're pit radial, and yet things like sea urchins seem to be very round. Things like sand dollars and sea biscuits seem to be also very round, but not, not like a ball. They're like a flattened ball. So the way I like to think of um, the echinoids is, imagine a starfish, or you can even imagine yourself as a starfish if your head was a bit longer to form the fifth arm. And what you've basically done is you've taken the five arms and you've sutured them together. So basically pull them all together and then sew them up uh, in between. And then that basically gives you a sea urchin, right? So now you just have spines on the outside. But basically all of the arms have been like sutured together to form a ball. And then if you take that same ball and then sort of smash it down where it's flat, basically that's what gives you a, a sand dollar or a sea biscuit. And that's what you have here. And when you actually look, at, we'll look at some um, some additional images in class of echinoderms, but you can look them up on the web. You'll actually see that all five arms are, are located around them, and you can see two feet that go up the sides of the body from those um, those same five five arms. Uh, what else do I need to tell you? They still have a water vascular system. They still have two feet. Um, the two feet are separate from those spines. Those spines are doing their own thing for defense. And then the last class is the holothyroidia. So these are often referred to as um, um, sea slugs. Um, they're, they're very squishy. Um, and they, they, they're, they're, it's hard to believe that these things are actually closely related to us. And they're also hard to believe that they're related to sea stars. But... If you look at them, it's basically a sea star that's been sutured together, and its feet have been sutured together, kind of like the echinoidea, and then stretch it out, and then you make, basically straight stretch it out like a balloon, and basically you've got um, these guys, these holothyroidea. So in this case, though, instead of having all five uh, rounds or, or arms of tube feet, they usually only have two on one side, and so the tube feet on these guys are on the bottom side, and I'll show you videos of this in just a moment. They normally have tentacles that they use to feed with. Um, all of these are kind of the scavengers of the ocean floor. They basically use these things to pull up particulate matter and they stick it in their mouth and then you know suck off the material. Um, as a result, these are basically um, sort of like the vultures of the ocean world. And so they're taking in a lot of decompo uh, decomposing material. They're great decomposers. Um, and they're also taking in a lot of particulate vegetative matter. And so as a result, they tend to have a fairly long gut to absorb, and they have all kinds of bacteria on the insides of their guts to try and help them break that stuff down. They also have this huge, what's called a respiratory tree here, um, that helps with uh, or assists in respiration. But they have, um, and you can't see it in this image, but they have some offshoots of the respiratory tree called the cuvarian tubules, and they use these for defense. And I'll show you videos of this in class. Um, let's see. what They still have a water vascular system, just like all the rest of the echinoderms. Um, okay. 
that's all I'm going to say for now for the podcast about the echinoderms. We'll go into more detail in class about some of the major features and their ecology and importance. Now what I'd like to do is um, get into the hemichordates, okay, so the sister relatives of the echinoderms. So remember, these two together form the ambulacraria. So let's talk about the other side, the ambulacraria. Oh, weird. Okay, here I go into more detail. Sorry, I forgot I had this. I thought we kind of did all this. Um, so echinoidea, it looks like that um, phylogeny came up for no reasons um, prematurely. Okay, so echinoidea, body enclosed in a test, so basically it's a really calcified, um, uh, hard and rigid structure. I forgot to tell you this on the previous slides. Okay, so when those arms got sutured up, it formed a rigid structure on the outside. They still have ossicles. Um, they just have um, a rigid structure on the outside. So I say here that they lack arms, but the, but the test is still pent ramus, and it looks like the S got cut off there. Um, but I already explained this to you um, previously. So... The arms are all sutured together, and they still have the two feet. They just don't have arms that are sticking out distinct from their body parts. By the way, here's you can here you can see the ambulacral grooves and um, the two the rows of um, tube feet. And you can see it up here and up here as well. And this is where some of the spines would be coming out. Uh, tube feet are extended to the up to the aboral side, so meaning that you actually have those tube feet going all the way up to the top. Uh, most urchins are regular shaped, so they're basically kind of cylindrical. Sand dollars and heart urchins are irregular or uh, more bilateral. Actually, they're, they're still radial. Uh, I'll show you a movie on how they move in class. This is just showing you more of the details. And by the way, you can see the pedicillariae here. So class Echinoidea has these pedicillariae. Uh, yeah, and some with venom, so they can actually make you hurt pretty badly. Uh, and I've already talked about the extensive intestine. Clearly I had some sort of malfunction on my slides here. I'm sorry about that. Um, and here you can see a close-up of the Aristotle's lantern. Oh yeah, and I'll show you this reproduction movie um, in class. So here's the sea cucumbers. Sorry, I said sleeve slugs earlier. Sea cucumbers, right? They actually come in a, a variety of different shapes and colors and sizes. And actually, if you look up some images on the web, you'll see some amazing looking sea cucumbers. So they often the ones that you see in those like touching pools at the zoo are like ugly and they look like giant turds and they feel like giant squishy turds. Um, but they actually come in a variety of shapes and sizes that are just beautiful. They do still have ossicles. There's a reduction in them, though. You don't have as many. And you, you can notice that when you touch them. Like, they're very squishy. But there are some. Yeah, sometimes they can get really, really big. Um, very big, as you can see here. Okay. So I point out here the ring canal and the madrepori just to reinforce that these guys um, still have a water vascular system. They can crawl along the seafloor, and they can swim, and I'll show you a video of this. It's pretty amazing what they can do. We talked about the intestine. I showed you the tentacles, and I'll show you how they feed in class. I talked about the respiratory sheet tree, and I'll show you videos of that in class as well. Um, and the cuvarian tubules, which is an offshoot of the respiratory tree. Okay, now we can get into the hemichordates. Okay, now, as I mentioned, in order to really put the hemichordates into context, you have to understand the major features of the chordata, so the chordates. Okay, so the phylum hemichordata refers to half chord, meaning that it's got some of the features of the chordates, but not all of them. And as it happens, this is a, a bit of a, care, a historical carryover. So there was once a time when the hemichordates were thought to be members of the chordata. And then as studies went on, really detailed studies, it was determined that, well, they are closely related, but they're, not, they're definitely not a member of the chordata. And some of the features that we thought they had in common with chordates turn out to be derivatives, evolutionary derivatives. So we know that they don't develop in the same way as they do in the chordates. So let me explain those. So that chordata, the, the chord that we're, they're referring to, um, it has to do with your, um, what your vertebral column, uh, but in, uh, in ancestral members, this was cartilaginous, so it's referred to as the notochord. So this is the support structure that's in the backs 
of members of the hemichordata and the, and the chordata, right? So this is basically your back support. And it's not only the back support for your body, so our rigid support structure for your body, but it's for attachment for muscles, and it's also protecting your central nervous system as well, so it's surrounding it. So it's a hugely important structure, major structure. So, okay, the classic chordate features include the notochord, which is, of course, the skeletal rod. And again, in, 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 um, in members that are not vertebrates, this thing is cartilaginous, okay? So it's totally made of cartilage until we get to the vertebrates. And then just to kind of give it reference for you, so it's, it ultimately ossifies and forms the vertebral column that you see here, so your spinal column not your spinal cord, which is a part of your nervous system, it's the bones, okay, it's the vertebrae. Okay, the second of five major features of the chordates is this dorsal hollow nerve cord. So this is the part of your spinal uh, cord that attaches to your brain, right? So in non-vertebrates, right, here's your brain, here's the nerve cords, this is going, so we've been talking about nerve cords going through the bodies of lots of animals, in chordates, you see it here, and normally in non-vertebrates, it's dorsal, dorsal hollow nerve cord. So it's above the notochord, okay? Here's where it is in you, though. Notice, so here's your spinal cord, and what it's doing is it's going through a hole that's in your vertebral column. So in the case of vertebrates, that vertebral column is actually protecting your nerve cord. Very important. Third major feature is pharyngeal um, pouches. So they're going to be present at some point in all chordates, at some, at some life stage. It might not be present in adulthood, okay, like it's not in you, but you have it as an embryo. So these are often referred to as gill slits as well, and you'll hear, hear me say that often in lecture. So by the way, this image right here is, is a, of a lancelet or an amphioxus, so it's one of the protochordates. Um, and you see it here. So in ancestral um, taxa, these pharyngeal gill slits are used for feeding structures. Okay, so water goes in the mouth, out those pharyngeal gill slits, and those gill slits um, have um, uh, a, uh, a sort of a, a structure in there with mucus, and it traps particulate matter and then transmits it over into the digestive system. But they can also be used for respiration, so that's where maybe your gills would be as well. So you have highly vascularized um, uh, gills that are there that are extracting oxygen from the water. So here you see them in fish. Here's the gills of fish, right? Which are not used for feeding in those guys. Th in those guys, it's used for respiration. You can see them in sharks, also used in respiration. But in amphioxus and in early chordates, it's used for feeding. Here you see it in lamprey. There's the gill slits there, okay? And then if we look at the embryos all the way up to humans, you can see pharyngeal gill slits at some point in the, uh, in the life cycle. The fourth major feature is what's called, referred to as the post-anal tail. This is a pet peeve of mine because there is no such thing as a pre-anal tail, so they should just call it a tail, but they don't. So in amphioxus, you can see it here. And then, of course, you know where it is in the fish, you know where it is in birds, mammals. And then we even have a remnant of this, too. So you have several bones in your what are, what's referred to collectively as the coccyx. And these are the remnants of the tail vertebrae. Now, there are sometimes humans that are born with a little bit or a lot of a tail. It's just usually surgically removed um, shortly after birth. So they have a postanal tail. And the fifth feature is what's called the endostyle. So in early chordates. This um, assists in food trapping, um, and, and uh, later it is transformed in evolutionary stages, uh, and it becomes the thyroid gland in things like vertebrates. And so the thyroid gland is really important in terms of regulating um, uh, your metabolism, uh, if it, uh, and it also has um, interactions with your immune system. So here's the endostyle, and it's usually right along the side of the pharyngeal gill slits. Produces mucus and helps to trap um, food particles that are then transmitted to the digestive system. But over time, it changes its function. 
and becomes the thyroid gland, which you see here. Not to be confused with the thymus gland, which is usually right in the center, right on top of your, um, your trachea. Okay, so those are the five major features of the chordates that you want to commit to memory. So, notochord, dorsal hollow nerve cord, pharyngeal gill slits, post anal tail, and endostyle. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to put those features here. So now let's go back to the hemichordates. Okay, so what do the hemis have that the full chordates, uh, sorry, have in common, okay? So they definitely have pharyngeal gill slits, and I'll show you this in detail here. Here they're referred to as the gill pores, and I'll show you how these guys um, pass water through them in just a moment. But they have the pharyngeal gill slits, and here's what's interesting. So for a long time, for um, decades and decades, it was believed that they had um, a notochord that was um, homologous with the chordates, right? Turns out <coughs> it's independently derived. It doesn't develop, it's a structure that doesn't develop in the same way from the same genes um, that the chordate notochord um, develops from. So this is referred to as a stoma cord. Um, it does give support and rigidity to the body of the hemichordates, but it doesn't, it's not a homologous structure with the chordate notochord. So in this image here, um, so let me just orient you. So here's the proboscis. The mouth it actually is in here, and this collar can be moved forward to close up the mouth or moved back to actually open up the mouth. And you can kind of see that here. Um, so here's the mouth, and they can actually move this collar back so that the mouth is open and water can pass into the mouth and then out through these gill slits. And then there are these mucus structures where they can trap particulate matter to, to feed. Um, or they can move this up and close the mouth. And you can see the kidney right here, the heart, and then this thing here, this yellow structure right here, is the stoma cord. And this is the structure that um, uh, scientists for years thought was homologous with the notochord, but it's not. Um, it's, it's completely independently derived. And by the way, I'd like to point out, this says kidney, but remember, this thing is a specialized kidney called an axial organ. We're not going to go into the detail of why it's different from um, the precursors that you've seen um, or even how it's related to the um, vertebrate ones. It is homologous to the vertebrate one, um, but it, acts, um, it doesn't have the same kind of nephron structure that you'll see uh, in ours. But it's close. It's really close. Um, I'll show you a video in class about kidneys and kidney structure and nephrons and how it relates to the nephridia. Okay. So don't forget, it is a deuterostome. We talked about this. So now we're all in the deuterostomes. From now on, it's nothing but deuterostomes. They are these worm-like bottom dwellers. So they're usually um, in, uh, marine, hanging out in the bottom, sometimes in um, uh, burrows that they make. And collectively, um, the internus are referred to as acorn worms. Uh, unclear to me why. Some people I know call them weenie worms. Maybe for an obvious reason. Um, but we're only talking about one aspect, the internusta, um, and this is what they look like. So there's a whole other branch of hemichordates that looks very different from this, but we're not covering them uh, in class. Oh, by the way, this is showing you the mouth open, mouth closed, gill pores. Uh, here's a picture that shows you some variation in the internus. Um, they all kind of look, they have a similar feature, but they differ in color and shape uh, a little bit but they're all marine. Um, they don't have any true gills um, in terms of respiration. So you saw those gill pores they use for feeding, but respiration is uh, via the epithelium. So they have branchial epithelium um, that's just inside their mouths, and then they can actually respire through the skin of their bodies as well. Um, we'll talk in class about how kidneys work in the uh, glomeruli. Um, um, so as it happens, in that axial complex, in the kidneys of um, both hemichordates and echinoderms, they do have uh, glomeruli. They don't work quite like ours do. It's, it's very similar, so it's the precursor to what we have. Um, and we'll talk about that in class, and I'll show you this video. Um, I'll also upload the, these lecture slides so you can actually see it for yourself. And... An interesting, unique feature of the internus is that they have, um, oh, sorry, I, I misspoke. I, I said that um, echinoderms have glomeruli. They do not. 
Um, so internus have them, but echinoderms do not. And then internus have two nerve cords, and I think, oh, I don't have a good picture of this to show you, but instead of having just one nerve cord going down the dorsum, they actually have two. And by the way, there's not much known about hemichordates, so there's a PhD waiting for lots of people if you want to go out and study these guys. Okay. Um, so, internus also have a larvae uh, that are referred to um, as tornaria larva. And here you see it here. Okay. And it's very similar to the bipinaria larva that you would have seen in echinoderms. Okay, so here's bipinaria, here's tornaria. Basically, tornaria just looks like a, a fatter, I mean, this is a stylized diagram, it looks like a fatter or more robust looking uh, bipinaria larva. Um, very similar. Um, and probably important to note is, of course, that you know tripartite salomic cavity compartmentalization. Um, I think, yep, I think that's it. Uh, so that's it for the hemichordates and the echinoderms. We'll go into more detail and talk about some of the bigger pictures in lecture. And the worksheet is up online. Take a look, and I will see you in class next week.